Hello friends, so I in this microstructure evolution the first uh, topic which we want to take is dynamic recovery. Okay, so, we want to see that how the dynamic recovery bring the microstructural changes in the material. Okay, so, what is the basis of this dynamic recovery? Okay, so, this we will uh, discuss in this particular lecture. Okay, so, if you kind of define where the dynamic recovery will be an important process. Okay, so, in terms of materials for high staking fault energy materials, that means the staking fault energy of the material which has high staking fault energy, these kind of materials show predominantly dynamic recovery. Okay. Instead of dynamic recrystallization, they show dynamic recovery. Okay. So, dislocation like to recover rather than uh, want to remain inside the grain. Okay. So, in this aluminum alloys, one of the very important alloy, alloy system, your alpha iron ferritic steel, all these are uh, come under high staking fault energy materials okay, and they show predominantly dynamic recovery. And usually if you do deformation at lower temperatures, okay, then you will uh, mostly see dynamic recovery in most of the material. Okay. So, at lower temperatures and in the material which has high staking fault energy, you will see dynamic recovery as the predominant uh, process through which the uh, restoration of the <coughs> material uh, property takes place, excuse me. So, if I want uh, you want to see uh, that how uh, we have already seen I think a stress strain curve uh, for dynamic recovery that how the stress strain curve will look like. Okay. So, usually we say that uh, after the initial part where the strain hardening is taking place, the strain hardening is when your dislocation density is increasing, dislocation multiplication is taking place. Okay. That is the part when you will have a strain hardening and as we have just seen in microstructural evolution that this is the phase where the subgrain will develop. Okay. So, dislocation will multiply, okay. they will interact and at the same time all this dislocation rearrangement will take place and form this small subgrains okay, with the low angle grain boundary around them. Okay, and these are the initial part of the strain hardening part in the uh, hot deformation process. And after a certain strain, okay, you will see that the the now the stress is independent of a strain. That means you have reached a kind of a steady state process. Okay, and with the strain there is no change in the stress. Okay, so now in this particular segment, your dislocation density is constant. Okay. So, dislocation density can be constant when you do not have any generation, okay. but in this case what happens is that the generation and the taking out of this dislocation or annihilation of this dislocation, these two processes kind of uh, become equal, uh, the rates of these two processes become equal. Okay. So, the dislocation multiplication and dislocation removal okay, from the grain. Uh, is equal, okay, the rate is equal, so that you do not see any change in the uh, flow stress. Okay. So, dislocation density is constant means the generation as well as the annihilation is constant, whereas in the initial process it was predominantly generation and annihilation was uh, the rate was lower. So, that is why you see the strain hardening and usually the subgrain also remain equixed more or less with constant mean size and constant minimum uh, mean misorientation. So, there is not much change in the microstructure also. So, it has reached a steady state condition. So, when you have this kind of condition, then we say that the material is deforming through dynamic recovery process. Okay, that the dynamic recovery process is the prominent process in this particular segment. Just as a word of caution, okay, do not uh, think that if uh, a flow curve is continuously showing a strain hardening, there is no recovery there. Okay. If you are doing a high temperature deformation or any deformation more than 0.3 Tm or 0.4 Tm and so on, okay, the recovery will always be there. Okay. The dislocation recovery will keep taking place. Okay. Only thing is which process is dominating. 
So, if you are seeing a strain hardening continuously for example, let us say stress uh, strain curve and but it shows a continuous uh, strain hardening ok. That means, the generation is more dislocation multiplication is more and dislocation uh, recovery is less ok. Recovery will take place. Uh, similarly, when the softening is taking place ok. There may be additional process of let us say recrystallization also, but maybe recovery will be there in that uh, in that condition also. And in the steady state condition of course, these two matches very nicely and we say that it is predominantly controlled by dynamic recovery ok. Now, if you see hot deformation ok, uh, I, you can divide the hot deformation this term into two terms ok, deformation of course. So, whenever you have deformation there are only two ways which with which you can do plastic deformation through dislocation activity or through twin twinning ok. So, twinning we, we are not considering here that much. So, uh, mainly it is through dislocation movement ok. So, when you impose a strain in the material ok to carry that strain ok you need that many dislocation. So, dislocation density will increase with the strain and that is why you see the strain hardening ok. So, any deformation process you will have associated dislocation generation and then dislocation movement ok. But at high temperature another thing which happens is called uh, what we call as equilibrium vacancy concentration. So, at any temperature above 0 Kelvin you will have some vacancies in the material ok and these are thermodynamic defect uh, vacancy uh, vacancy is a thermodynamic defect. So, it is it, it will always be there and the change of equilibrium vacancy concentration as a function of temperature is exponential ok. So, as you in keep increasing the temperature it will increase exponentially. Now, this <coughs> what this uh, vacancies do is that they actually help in the uh, recovery of the dislocation ok. So, if you want to just see a, a relationship a vacancy concentration in mole fraction is related with activation energy and the temperature. So, temperature is a very important factor here ok. Activation energy will be constant for formation of vacancy ok. So, as you increase the temperature there will be exponential in, uh, increase in the vacancy concentration. Okay. So, now how this vacancies help in the recovery process. So, when you have deformation first, so dislocation will increase, dislocation interaction takes place ok. Now, dislocation when the dislocations are involved ok in absence of let us say temperature also there will always be some interaction between the dislocation ok. So, if you want to see uh, any two dislocation for example, I take two edge dislocation of same sign ok. Now, they will also have some stress field associated with them ok. So, you will have a compressive stress field here and tensile here similarly compressive here and tensile here tensile here ok. And if they are close to each other their stress field will interact ok and these two dislocation would like to come one ab uh, over another ok. If the dislocation are of not opposite sign again taking the edge dislocation ok, that these two dislocation would like to arrange in a way that they are at 45 degree angle to each other ok ok. So, this is the usual interaction in absence of temperature also this kind of gliding. So, dislocation will move only in its particular slip plane in the slip direction ok and if they are close enough where their stress field can interact with each other they would like to arrange in a particular fashion ok and this is how they will try to arrange. If of the same sign one over another if opposite sign then uh, at 45 degree angle ok. So, this is this is a usual conservative motion of dislocations ok. Now, when you are at high temperature ok there is an additional movement which you are allowing a dislocation to have and which is what we call as dislocation climb ok, which is a non conservative movement ok, glide is uh, we consider as conservative movement and the climb as non conservative movement ok. So, just to make you understand this climb process 
Okay, suppose again taking the edge dislocation. Okay. So, I am just drawing, I uh, hope I am drawing it correctly here, this will come here and so on and then there will be next layer okay, and ok. So, you have a edge dislocation here which is ending somewhere here ok. So, now let us say there is a vacancy as you increase the temperature there will be more vacancies, uh, one vacancy is, is jumping okay, and suppose it has first come here, there is a vacancy here now. Now, this atom sees this vacancies, okay. then let us say this atom jumps here is now coming here. So, vacancy has moved from this place to this place. Now, this the additional uh, plane which is there for the edge dislocation this particular atom at the end of the dislocation also sees this particular vacancy and it jumps here. Okay. So, let us erase this one now from here and create this particular one here. So, what you can see here is that the dislocation has climbed by one atomic distance now. Okay. Okay, so, the, what you can see here is that dislocation has climbed by one, one atomic distance. Okay. So, the vacancy is how they are helping is that this dislocation now climb okay. and that is how a dislocation can recover or dislocation can be removed from the grain by this climbing process. Okay. So, this dislocation climb can happen only when you are at uh, sufficiently high temperature where the equilibrium vacancy concentration is of certain amount okay. then only it will be effective process for dislocation climb. And also you can see that because temperature is in the diffusion is a temperature dependent process. So, for diffusion of vacancies also you need a high temperature. So, for creation of vacancies as well as our diffusion of vacancies for both you need high temperature then only you will have this kind of climbing process. Okay. And this type of climbing can keep happening as more and more vacancies are there. Okay. So, you have dislocation generation due to deformation and you have dislocation recovery through this kind of climbing process dislocation climb. And also this climbing process then uh, helps in kind of rearrangement of dislocation okay. and uh, as I told you that this, this rearrangement you can develop uh, a, a small or low angle grain boundary. For example, let us say I have a crystal like this. Okay and I am now deforming it. Okay. So, let us say I have deformed it like this. Okay. So, now you can see that there is a tensile strain here and compressive strain here. The length is shorter in the bottom and length is more towards the top. Okay. So, to have this kind of straining definitely I will have to introduce dislocations here. Okay. Okay. So, initially these dislocations are all randomly arranged, okay. but suppose if I also do it at uh, a sufficiently high temperature then what will happen that this dislocation will like to rearrange okay. and then this particular crystal again the same strain is there, but now let us say the dislocation are arranged in a particular fashion. Okay. So, th suppose you have started with a single crystal. Now, you can see that this single crystal is divided into a small subgrains and this dislocation arrangement can create a low angle grain boundary. Okay. As you must be knowing a model of uh, grain boundary is through arrangement of this dislocation like this one over another. Okay. So, individual grains subgrains are there which is surrounded by this low angle grain boundary. Okay, that is what you can again see I have say, taken the same micrograph here that these are your high angle grain boundary and the grain hang or uh, bigger grain is divided into smaller sub grain which is surrounded by this low angle sub grain boundaries. Okay. 
Now, the another way to look at these kind of uh, subgrains, as I told you in optical microscopy, you won't be able to see. Another way to look at it is called ACM channeling contrast. So, using scanning electron microscope, and in that there is a technique called channeling contrast. You can now again see that the and uh, again uh, it is channeling contrast actually use the orientation information of the grain to give a grayscale image here. Okay. So, this is small subgrains which you can see here also. I think if you see the scale, uh, it might match 50 micron is here and there are let us say 5 or 6 grains here. So, around 10 micron and here it is 20 micron again 10 micron. So, these subgrains are uh, uh, right now in this particular microstructure is around 10 micron. Okay. So, you can see this small subgrains okay, within the grain using this particular technique. So, you can use different technique to view different microstructural features. Okay. So, a typical recovered microstructure will look something like this with high angle grain boundaries okay, and the grain is subdivided into subgrains You and these subgrains will be surrounded by low angle or subgrain boundaries. Okay. Now, subgrain size also I can uh, kind of uh, uh, quantify. Okay. As you can see that I, if I know the subgrain size, I can plot a, 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 a relationship between the subgrain size and the normalized stress. For example, in this particular graph, what you can see is a normalized subgrain size and this is normalized stress. Okay. And this you can actually relate with a relationship like this. Okay. The, so, D is your subgrain size. And Z here is your Z or one parameter. If you remember, I think we have discussed it earlier also. This Z is actually is something like this. Actually, it uh, take into account both the strain rate and temperature in the single parameter. Okay, so actually the effect of uh, strain rate is that if you increase the strain rate okay then the flow stress will increase okay because you will have more dislocation and then they, they will interact and so on the rate of generation of uh, dislocation will be high as you increase the strain rate if you decrease the temperature again the uh, uh, effect on the stress is that it will be higher the flow stress will be higher as the temperature is lower okay so, if I want to show stress will be higher when you have higher strain rate and lower temperature. Okay. So, these two effect is combined in this zener holomben parameter as I told you earlier also. So, when strain rate is high, temperature is low means Z will be high. Okay. So, you can see now that there is a relationship between uh, I can kind of have stress the flow stress as function of some function of z that as z increases my stress increases. So, you can see that when the normalized stress is increasing here that means the z must be increasing here and what is the effect of that on the grain size as the stress is increasing means I can say that my z is increasing in this direction or I can say my strain rate is increasing in this, this direction or and temperature is reducing in this direction. So, as my z is increasing or normalized stress is increasing, my grain size is refining. Okay. So, if now you can see that I can now control the microstructure. If I want a finer subgrain size, I have to deform the material at higher strain rate and lower temperature. Now, what is the drawback of that for a practicing engineer for example, if I increase the strain rate and do deformation at lower temperature my flow stress will be higher okay. and when the flow stress will be higher that will have impact on all my uh, machinery which I am using. For example, if I am using rolling or extrusion, okay. so my roll mill has to be designed for that kind of flow stress. Okay. I will require higher energy for deformation because flow stress is higher. Okay. So, what microstructure I need okay, for a certain property 
and how I am going to get it. This is all interconnected. Okay, so when you have normal more normalized stress means you will have finer grain size or finer sub grain size. Okay. So, th these are some important relationships in the dynamic recovery process that how the microstructure will be changing. So, you can see that a big grain uh, okay, which is surrounded by high angle grain boundary okay, then kind of gets subdivided into sub grains okay, something like this. So, these are all low angle grain boundaries. Okay, and this size is again controlled by the deformation uh, parameters, which is our strain rate and temperature. Okay, so these all are controlled together to give you a certain microstructure. Okay, in recovery, mostly we will say that uh, that there is no. If you see an optical microscope, you won't be able to see any big change in the microstructure. Of course, they, the grains will be elongated because of the deformation process, okay. but with different strain you will not be able to see only the it will get elongated more, okay. but uh, other than that you will not be able to see much change. Okay. The texture also would remain more or less similar, okay. there will not be much change in the texture of the material. Okay. But internally there is a refinement through subgrain uh, formation and the uh, change in the subgrain size. Okay. So, thank you with this our dynamic recovery part is over. Okay. Now, we will discuss dynamic recrystallization.